Hey there, sports psych enthusiasts. I'm Dr. Colin Fair, and I want to share my passion with you. I love talking about ways to unleash the power of the mind. This recording is part of a larger lecture series I've created in an effort to make sports psychology concepts more accessible to a larger audience. The information contained in this series is especially well suited for students of sports psychology and is presented in a way that makes for easy listening for all. Welcome to Sports Psych Concepts. Hey there, welcome to all my listeners to this Sports Psych Concepts lecture recording presentation. I'm Dr. Colin Fair. Excited to do this one for you today because it's something that is uh, very captivating to the mind and the attention, attention, and really it's like a, epitomizes one of the things that athletes do to enhance their performance, and that, of course, is imagery. So, want to go over how do we unlock the power? Of imagery, so we'll we'll define it in this presentation, so you have a working understanding of what it is. Talk about some of the key characteristics and key considerations for effective imagery, how to make it good, uh, what is it used for? Like there's lots of different things. We just say, okay, performance, that's one general thing, but what are some what are some more specific uses of it? And then some key aspects of imagery programs. If it's something that an applied sports psych consultant is going to program. And then, of course, I always like to end with some pro tips. So lots of goodies planned for you. So let's jump right in. Okay, so first, what is imagery? We've we've got to define it. I mean, it's often used interchangeably with this visualization term out there. I've even used it interchangeably in the past, but it really visualization is just one part of imagery because imagery, we want to use all of the senses, whereas visualization is really you're just imaging, putting certain images in your mind and it's it's really you're creating or recreating an experience just visually, right? Whereas, like I said, imagery, we're creating or recreating uh, the entirety of the experience, including all of the senses. So it is really powerful because it allows athletes to train their technical, tactical, and their mental skills without exerting themselves physically. So you can still work on a lot of those things and have these sort of little uh, micro muscular contractions because your your brain you're seeing these images these experiences in your mind it doesn't doesn't your body doesn't know the difference really right and so you you can basically affect a lot of the the things that you're wanting to have happen in a real physical performance within your mind so it's really amazing and importantly all great athletes use this right as as a way to complement their actual physical practice, right? So with that, it's important to understand that it, 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 we don't wanna use it to replace physical practice, right? But it can be used to enhance it. So that's really an important thing to know about imagery is like, yeah, okay, you're not gonna say, well, I'm just not gonna train. Uh, I'm not gonna go out there and exert myself physically because I don't wanna get tired. Uh, I'm just going to train using imagery. It's like, okay, well, I mean, you may actually experience some benefit better than than doing nothing, but it's it, it can't replace the physical practice of actually going out there and doing it. So we have to think of it as something that will enhance that training uh, most importantly. Now, I've alluded to this already. One way that imagery is is distinct from mere visualization is that it's 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 a sensory experience so we we really want to create a vivid and a meaningful experience when we are imaging situations we want to make it as real as possible and and it it's even better if we attach an emotion or some sort of mood to the imagery right it can be really helpful for situations that we usually get anxious in we attach some positive or you're, you're cool, calm, and collected. You image that in, in your mind and in, in practice and in training. You see yourself being relaxed and composed 
in a situation that maybe normally would cause anxiety. That's a big part of it. But we want to involve as many senses as possible when we're doing this. So we want to involve the kinesthetic sense. Imagine the actual body positions that we're going to be in. So think of a gymnast, right, and all of the different types of movements that they do in incorporating, incorporating every single plane of motion that's possible and depending on the the particular event most of those events are using all of them so we want to we want to engage that kinesthetic sense okay we also want to engage the visual sense which is an obvious thing like what are the things that we're seeing and then more specific than that can we can we get more specific and, and narrow it down if i'm a basketball player shooting free throws maybe i focus on the front of the rim or maybe it's the back of the rim or or if i'm going to shoot a bank shot uh, on off the angle then maybe i'm looking at that high uh corner of the of the square on the backboard okay so we 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 want to really narrow that down and get it to be really specific you'll see this a lot of times in in golfers right they're not just kind of aiming for a, a general area on the golf course it's like that leaf out there see that 220 yards away that's what i'm aiming for that leaf right there it's like that that small okay so kinesthetic sense visual sense the auditory sense can be powerful so hearing the noise of the crowd hearing the different things that are going to be there oftentimes if i do a, a an imagery script for athletes i'll kind of uh talk about the buzz of the environment or the arena before the event if it's an indoor an indoor venue right can be really really uh engaging most of us if we've been to a sporting event where there's in an arena we can hear all of those things as you're as you're going in maybe the game's already started or the warm-ups are happening you hear the music playing and there's people talking and there's just so many things going on so bring all of that in then there's the tactile sense is is another one that we can use here that is is a good one right so i've had athletes uh tennis players in particular where the, i i get them to feel the felt on a tennis ball right it's kind of fuzzy yellow ball i feel that uh what that feels like in your hand as you move it around in your hand as you're maybe you're you're holding the ball before you're about to hit a serve right so you're bringing that in and there's the olfactory sense. So back to the arena example, what's up, the smell of popcorn and and pretzels with cheese sauce or nachos or whatever else is that they're serving hot dogs at the all super healthy food, right? That they're that they're serving at the uh, event and and bring that in. Or if it's an outdoor event, freshly cut grass or the smell of grass after a recent rain or uh different things that that uh signify things right often have nostalgia attached to different smells that we have but bring that bring that in it's pretty amazing and and it even could be gustatory right taste if you taste certain things in the air all of these things make for more effective imagery if we include them in in the program that we're using okay moving forward with some other important considerations along with what has already been mentioned, there are a couple of keys to effective imagery that are essential to understand. And the first one is controllability. We, we need to have the ability or develop the ability to imagine exactly what we intend to happen. So we don't wanna focus on what we don't wanna have happen. We need to be able to see in our mind and play out what it is we want to have happen and then we need to be able to manipulate different aspects of those images because it, it negative imagery can certainly disrupt performance right if an athlete can't control their images and they're seeing the wrong things at the wrong time that certainly can lead to to poor performance so just a classic example is a tennis player about to hit a second serve on match point okay and they're thinking in their mind don't double fault don't double fault don't double fault right as they toss that ball up into the air and of course what happens they chunk it into the net or they frame it long or wide or whatever because they they put they had all these negative images in their mind that preceded that so that's a that's indicative or can be indicative of a lack of controllability so we, we don't want to spend a lot of time imaging disastrous situations we've got to be able to control the images 
And so that's the first key. The second key is we, we want our images to be very vivid. So vividness is the key. It's like how, how clear and detailed the image appears in our mind. It can't be just too, it, it can't be too vague. So, okay, it could be something like, well, is the image in color? How many senses are being used in the imagery practice? And what's the emotion or physical sensations that are experienced? Both of those things, controllability and vividness, are things that can be trained, that can be practiced and developed. And one other important consideration to mention here is that there can be two broad perspectives that we use when we're doing imagery. So it, it can be effective really from both perspectives, but some athletes or tasks may warrant one perspective over the other. So the internal perspective would be well, I'm seeing the image from inside my body the way that my eyes would normally see it, right? So th this might be the best way to experience kinesthetic imagery, right? Where it's, it's first person, it's through my perspective in my eyes. But there may be times where external imagery might be, might be more useful, where I'm seeing the image from outside my body as if I am viewing myself. So I think of, of uh, weightlifting is like a great example here right or even even sports like tennis or volleyball or different ball sports where i'm i'm stepping outside myself and i'm seeing myself execute the skill or if i'm trying to learn a skill i do this with beginner athletes often it's like, okay watch watch me this is what it looks like repeat it three times now you go and do it so they got those fresh images in their mind of what it's supposed to look like and then they go and, and practice it. So they have that external perspective that they're replaying. So those are all some important considerations, the vividness, the controllability, and then what the, whatever the perspective is that we're using uh, to, to have effective imagery. Now that we have a sort of general understanding of imagery, what it is, and some of the keys to make it effective, what, what can we use it for? There's obviously a lot of things, but how, how can we break it down to be more specific? Well, there's improved concentration is a classic one. So we can see ourselves in the moment uh, that we're performing on where we actually focus on the relevant cues. And, and that can enhance our ability because we see ourselves focusing on the right things at the right time because many athletes get in those pressure situations and they start to feel a little bit anxious and so then they their concentration uh, fades it, it, it can become too narrow or in some instances it actually can go in the other direction oftentimes it becomes too narrow and so they miss things so we can improve our concentration ability to focus on the right things because we imagine ourselves doing that and so then when we get into that situation it's just we've already been there so it just happens so we can improve in concentration, we can enhance motivation, we can see ourselves be successful, and, and that, of course, can be motiv motivating itself, or we can make repetitive practice more interesting, right? So persistence, because we see, we, we, we see ourselves working through different challenges or problems in our mind, and we see the, 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 the performance and the outcome on the other end of that, and, and that can can enhance our motivation in a big way. It also can build confidence. So we, it's, it's, I had a, a mentor in graduate school who mentioned this was a national uh, caliber coach, U.S. cross country and Nordic combined team coach, and uh, never forget where he said, "See yourself the way you want to become, and you will move in that direction." So you can build confidence. See yourself being confident in your mind we know what confidence is when we see it and sometimes it's like well i don't really feel that but can you can you see that can you see yourself with that and when we see it in our mind and then that's one way that we can build that to get it to where we want it to be because obviously confidence is important on its uh, on its own really important asset to have we can use imagery to uh, control our emotions so either to get pumped up or to be calmed down. So it can be sort of an anxiety control before or during competition. Because again, we, we see ourselves experiencing the emotions that we want to have that are functional emotions and that we are amped up to the proper level. Imagery can be used for that. We can use it to, to develop sports skills. So I already used that example with youth sport athletes 
who are learning a new skill and maybe I don't really know what that looks like. I don't really know what it feels like. I hear you describe it, but I don't really great have a great sense or a picture in my mind. And so we can we can we can give them that picture, right? We can look ahead to upcoming skills. We can look at back at previously performed skills. But an important thing here is we we have to take into account the skill level of the individual. So if we're if we're working with a youth athlete and we're actually putting together an imagery script for them when we're describing all of these aspects, they might not be able to generate those pictures because they don't they they just don't have the skill. They're too new. They don't have enough exposure to the sport. So we can use that in an actual practice context where we show them, we give them the images in our, in our mind, here it is, or we can use video imagery. We paint those pictures there so, so they can retrieve that when we actually use the imagery. And that can be useful to develop those, those sports skills. We also can use it to develop strategy. So a, an example here is a quarterback in football might, they might visualize passing options in certain situations. Okay, a runner might visualize different race scenarios. So I've used that one often with athletes is, all right, well, I want you to see all of these different situations in, in, that can unfold in the race and you come up with a response for each one and you plan that out and you see that happen in your mind. And, and again, no great athlete who's ever accomplished anything great didn't first see it happen in their mind. They've seen themselves, every, every kid on a recess, uh, basketball court on a schoolyard around the country as the bell rings they shoot the game-winning shot as they run off the court right they're seeing it in their mind they're already doing it so we can develop sports strategy we can help prepare for competition obviously with those different situations we can use imagery to help us cope with pain or injury that we're dealing with a, a lot of mental training this is this is actually an area that's really really useful for imagery. A lot of mental training can be done when we're hurt physically. We can't do the physical stuff, but we can train ourselves mentally. We can develop all those things. We can see our comeback. We can visualize our tissues healing, right? See those little construction workers inside your joints, inside your body, rebuilding those connective tissues to, to, to um, cut down on that recovery time. Really can be a great tool in that instance. And we can also use imagery for solving problems. We, we can compare performances to figure out how to fix problems, things that have gone on in the past. All right, I'm gonna go back into this moment. I don't really know what went on, so I'm gonna go back and replay the image in my mind, and then I'm gonna compare that to a very positive image of a time that things went really well. So we can identify the problem and, and figure out how to fix it. So not an exhaustive list, but a pretty juicy list of all the different things that you can do. Essentially, imagery is like the center point for all these other sports psychology concepts that are important to have in our toolbox. So to take this a little bit further now, I want to look at imagery programs. If I'm a sports psychology consultant and I've been recruited to work with a team or work with some athletes or talk to some coaches about this, uh, they want me to put together an imagery program. What are some things that I need to consider for that? Okay, first of all, you need to sell it. Okay, we, a lot of athletes, maybe they kind of understand it a little bit intuitively because they do it on their own. Some of them may not do it at all. I've had some athletes that's like, yeah, it just doesn't, doesn't work for me. I'm not really interested in doing that. And, you know, okay, wow, amazing. And, and so we need to be able to introduce it and we need to create a hook, right? Define it, give some evidence, explain how it works uh, to, 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 uh, to get buy-in, right? So we have to sell it to then get the buy-in. And so we can use some exa simple examples here, like, well, you have the, there's a string here and then a bolt that's around the, 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 there's a bolt in the middle of the string, right? You're holding the string on either end. And can you see that in your mind? You paint that picture or your arm, visualize your arm as an iron bar, for example. So, so all of this is important to introduce the skill, to help them understand what it is. They paint, you get them to paint these pictures in their mind and these experiences. And then you give them specifics about how it's gonna be used. 
So that's a big part of it. And then we need to evaluate their imaging ability. So as I said, I've had some athletes who aren't really interested in this. And, and a big part of that is because it's kind of threatening to them almost because they don't have the skill develop. They don't, they don't have, they can't create vivid images. They don't have any controllability over their images. They can't focus long enough to do a 10 minute imagery script. They get distracted too easily. And so then that's not gonna be as effective for them. And so we need to evaluate their ability. If they can only concentrate for two minutes, then your imagery script only needs to be two minutes. Don't, don't prescribe them a 10 minute imagery script if they don't have that ability. Okay, so we, we, we can use the sport imagery evaluation, which is a different, uh, it's an assessment tool, or there's some other tools out there that you can, that you can use. And practice needs to be daily. I've told this to a different athletes and students I've worked with over the years is I, I uh, shoot free throws uh, every night as I'm laying in bed going to sleep or I hit tennis balls. And that's just a nightly nightly routine. I do it every single night as I'm laying in bed. I, I image these different things and and um, it's just part of uh, it's just ritualistic and it's that just happens to be what it is now. It used to, when I was competing, it was many different things, but we want it to be daily practice. There's so many opportunities for us to do that throughout the day that we, we don't even think about. And it doesn't have to be like, oh, and I practiced for two hours today doing imagery. It's like, oh, take five minutes before you go to bed and image some, put all these positive images in your mind and see if you can mess around with the images and, and how vivid you can make them and control them. I think that uh, with the advent, this is an A side, but with the advent of virtual reality, I think there's the potential to really take this to the next level. We also want it to be individualized. So the best programs, imagery programs will not be cookie cutter imagery programs. And this is what makes it hard. If you wanna go and do imagery with an entire team, there are some things that, you, that can benefit the entire team but the language or the, 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 the setting or the scenes or the things that you're trying to create or the, the terminology that you use needs to be as specific to that group as possible, whatever that team culture is, uh, to be the most effective. So the best imagery programs are individualized. The athlete, if you're working one-on-one -on -one with an athlete, should be involved in that process to give you some key phrases or things that, that are significant to them. And we want to use imagery in practice and in competition, right? There's different times that we can use it. We can use it before a competition itself. We could use it before a particular skill. If I'm a volleyball player stepping up to the line, I can close my eyes for a second, keep them open, whatever. I want to see everything unfold the way I want it to unfold before, it, before I even... Uh, initiate that service motion. Okay, so we can use it before, we can use it we, uh, uh, as a whole before competition or before specific skills. That would be during competition. You could also use it, say, dur in, in, uh, during a, a timeout, for example, or at halftime, different situations. You can use it. And we can use it after, of course. And after is kind of the one that maybe doesn't get used as often in a formal sense, but athletes do this. They go and replay all of the things that happened in their mind. And sometimes it's the negative images. And so that's something that can be practiced is I'm only gonna replay the positive things. Or if I ha have negative things that happened or they didn't happen the way I want to, I wanna replace those images with the, what I would have wanted to have happen in that situation. And we can use it during injury, which I've already kind of alluded to. So a lot of a lot of useful tips here for imagery programs on how to make them effective. Now to wrap up, I want to mention a few pro tips here because that's one of my favorite things to do when we're talking about imagery. And the first one, simply put, is is to make it real, right? Paint the the, the picture to where it's as real as possible. And again, like I just mentioned, it needs to be individualized. Paint the picture of something that they can experience and it's like they're really there. You really actually want to imagine yourself as if everything is happening right now. And that's some common language that I use in scripts that I write is like, imagine it yourself experiencing this as if it's happening right now.
Okay, so you want to make it real as real as possible. And another way you can make it real is to practice imagery in the very setting that you will perform in. Go to the gym so you have the smells and all of those different things there. Uh, wear your competition outfit even is one of those recommendations out there that can make it more make it more real. And and um, but it's also important to vary the location and the setting also, right? So you can change the the these these different aspects like that. So change the location, change the temporal aspects so we can do real time, slow motion, fast motion. Uh, this this can be one of those things. If so, if I'm if a competition is going to last an hour, I'm not going to sit there and image for an hour. I can I can skip things, right? I can I can start at the beginning of the competition and then there's sort of this crescendo where I build into the main part of it and then we're down to crunch time at the end and I see this this successful uh, execution of the skill at the end that maybe leads to the win. Right, so we 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 want to make it real, and but then we also want to vary these different aspects that we have some control over. And technology can be powerful. I mentioned virtual reality. I think that perhaps in the future somehow this is going to change everything relative to imagery, or at least in a, in a big sense. Right, is using virtual reality. We can cr actually create the images and the things that we want to experience and paint these pictures and have these experiences that are very real. So there's that potential out there. But in the meantime, we have music, right? This technology that we can use to enhance and sort of uh, attach these, these feelings and images to certain songs or certain sounds or words or things. So that's technology we can use biofeedback and neurofeedback or a couple of other tools that are out there and when and when paired with the right practitioner who has training on how to use those things, we can train train those physical responses along with the images that we want and cue those in. So neurofeedback's like, okay, well I want to train my mind when I'm having these positive images, I want to train, uh, train my mind to have the optimal uh, brain wavelength that is associated with peak performance. Okay, so that that's some, some pretty nifty stuff to dive into that. And uh, it did also kind of mention this one, so I wanna hit on it again, because it's important. We wanna see both the performance and the outcome. So I've talked to some athletes who say, well, I, I, what, I ask them what they see. You know, like I see myself holding the trophy, raising it up in the air, and I've won. And so that's the outcome. So that can be motivating for, for a lot of athletes. But we also wanna see the performance. So there's those two different aspects. We wanna see the performance and the outcome both of them. And we, we lastly, we want to be systematic with it. So it shouldn't be just some sort of random thing. It often happens to us where we kind of just get lost and we're spacing out and our mind is creating these things. But we, in order to get the most out of it, we do want it to be systematic. We want to have some sort of program uh, that is, is uh, surrounded by or, or characterized by Go specific goals that we've set and things that we're trying to accomplish and that it incorporates all of these senses intentionally and, and all of the other tips I've mentioned. So with that, thanks for listening to this point. We've covered a lot today. What is imagery in terms of a definition, the different characteristics, considerations, what we use it for, like what are the different applications, what are the keys for uh, an imagery program, and then, and then of course the pro tips are always kind of fun to mention at the end. So hopefully this was beneficial to you. Go out there and image some positive things. Work on making your images more vivid, uh, controllability, play around with the different perspectives that you can have and incorporate some of the other things that I've mentioned. And, and I know that you'll, you'll have some more successful, successful performances if you do this, uh, just like the pros do. So thanks and, and see you next time. Thank you for listening to this recording in the Sports Psych Lecture Series. I hope you learned something. More importantly, I hope you learned something that you can apply in your life. Feel free to share this presentation with others who might be interested. And if you're interested in more content like this, visit the Fair Advantage channel on YouTube or find the Fair Advantage podcast on Spotify or visit my website at fairadvantage.com.